We're gonna enjoy this place. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everybody, it's George the Antique Nomad. Uh, about 20 years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine who was stationed in the Army in Columbus, Georgia. And I had some time while he had to work, and I went to a tiny little town just wandering around sightseeing and discovered that there was this little place with antiques called Parrot, Georgia. I haven't been there in years, and recently I got a chance to pass through that way and decided to stop and see what was there today. You know you're in Parrot when you see this tiny building that used to be the train depot. The town was never very big, I think it peaked at about 300 residents, but at one time, until the Depression, it had the most millionaires per capita in the state of Georgia, and there's some lovely old homes here as well. So I recognize the place right away because this building sticks out at an angle to the road, and high-end antiques it is. However, the rest of the town, much to my dismay, is empty. It has become a ghost town. It's sad to say, but in the South particularly, it seems like a lot of the little town antique destinations that used to be really neat have kind of dried up. A lot of the folks were elderly back then, and I think that they're just not with us anymore. An antique destination only can thrive if it's located where bigger populations can get to it, and if they promote. It is so important to tell people you're out there. And in this new era of social media, some of those places just couldn't keep up. But Meridine's was the best shop in town, and they're still here, so we're going to enjoy this place. It's early summer, so we're still seeing wicker, and that's a nice 1920s piece with the arched back. Here we've got a 70s rattan piece, and let's do a little window shopping because some of this you can't see from the inside. This is a particularly nice ship's lantern. This is a copper anchor lantern from Glasgow, Scotland. These can sell for as much as $2,000 in that large size. They are very collectible and desirable now. These folks get a lot of things from the UK and Europe. This is the Internal Detective Bureau for the Merchant Police, a 1930s sign. I thought that was pretty attractive. And there is a jeweled, thus American, late 1800 slag and stained glass window. What a beaut. This is a small mall in reality, even though it has a single person's name. It actually has about 20 different dealers, so there is some variety in here. It's mostly traditional. In this part of the country, antiques really are a traditional thing. Uh, Georgia's a very old state, one of the original 13 colonies, and so a lot of the taste here runs to true Victorian and earlier antiques, European antiques are popular. So it's a little different look than we see in some of the more modern parts of the United States where antique and vintage are sold. The first thing I notice is this wonderful mid-Victorian inlaid inkwell stand. It's got the little drawers, it's got its original ivory knobs because they're very small, that doesn't affect its saleability, which is a good thing. And it's just gorgeous. They also have a lot of nice sterling silver here. A lot of it is American makers and some really interesting forms. The third from the left there is an asparagus fork. That's why it's got those little round pieces between the tines. It wasn't really meant to stab the asparagus. You're just supposed to gently shovel it off of an asparagus tray. The Victorians, of course, really loved having a tableware item for every purpose they could imagine, and that tradition in sterling silver sets carried well into the 20th century, really until the modernist era. So we see a lot of oddball things that are really fun, everything from ice cream forks to little salt spoons, and then regular things that you would use like slotted jelly spoons and meat forks. This is the type of silver you do not melt for silver scrap value because it has a great value beyond that. This set of Staffordshire figurines is interesting. These are called spill vases. 
They had a little bed vase built into the figure, and this was some of the very first wear that was available to the middle class in England around the 1850s. A lot of people say they don't like this stuff, but that generally means they haven't seen the really well-done early examples, which these are. You can see in the delicacy of the painting and the fineness of the quality that there were different levels even back then. This is a nice oval fronted case with a secretary desk at the bottom. This is going to date to sometime around 1890. You'll see a real emphasis in this store, and it's a good way to display, where they put house books and magazines and things that show how to incorporate old things into new design. And much like Etsy commands higher prices for certain things than eBay because they're design focused, that's what stores like this do. This is a beautiful Majolica planter. This is English, it's going to be about 1890. The colors are great and the condition's amazing. We have another bunch of sterling silver here and a lot of it is three or four different patterns. The patterns and makers really matter in terms of value. There are about 20 different dealer spaces like this in this store. You see the balloon back Victorian settee that's going to date to about 1890 with that dark walnut frame. On the right here we have a mix of older and traditional 20th century decor. So the rooster painting is actually not all that old. The cloisonne pieces are probably mid 1900s, but it all has this same traditional look. This Chinese looking piece is something that you would probably find out in the wild because that might only be 30 or 40 years old. It just happens to match this style. And they're very good in this store about showing, and obviously they've marked it down because it's not selling fast because this nice checkerboard top table says repo, and by that they mean reproduction. So this is something that a reproduction to them would still be vintage to a lot of resellers today, but that's because it's about 30 to 40 years old. And because they're doing antique interiors, they will mix things like this, but they're very honest about the representation, and that's really important to protect the antique market. So they're very smart about that. On the other hand, this is a Victorian piece. This is a game table. They set up like a hall table, but then you can flip the top and spin it, and you have a place to play games. A very popular form in Victorian times, and a very popular form today. These really do still sell. Now, they don't sell for quite as much as they used to, so you see the markdown here. And I think because this store is now on its own, they have had to mark down a lot of items because there isn't as much of a draw here today. The redware is obviously selling. There's a bunch of holes in this space, and redware has always seemed to be popular with a certain type of decorator. If you didn't like the blue, you tended towards the red, and it's transferware. These are transfer decals. It has great color. I also, of course, always notice bookends, and these are a nice pair with the dogs. They date to about 1920, and they are a pot metal, it appears, and they're just a neat design. One thing that becomes a problem when you're in an interior store is furniture. If it doesn't move and you buy more, you end up with a really difficult to access space. And some of these are a little tight to get into here. Now, I see a really nice table on the left here. I'm very fond of the wicker with the wood top. We're going to see some more of that here. A daisy churn. We see these a lot in the south. This is Georges Briard. This was made by Georges Briard using Columbia enamelwares bases because they were about to go out of business, and he basically saved them. It says 1950s. It's actually a little closer to the late 60s, early 70s, but it's a great design, and he really helped keep enamelware in the market in the 1970s. This extract crock or jug from about 1900 with the slipware advertising the company out of Buffalo, New York, has been turned into a lamp, and they didn't destroy it in the process. I've got to say, I usually hate it when people convert things into lamps, because in the old days, what that meant is taking a wonderful vase or a jug and drilling a hole in it, taking an old kerosene lantern and drilling holes in it to put electricity in it, and it ruins the piece. It really devalues them quite a lot. Fortunately, in this case, what they did is they just took a cap that they could plug into the top that had the electrical service. And so the cord hangs down, you have to hide it in the back, but it means they didn't ruin the piece. So I approve. 
interesting wicker mirror there on the left. Nice piano stool. Now this set here is not Royal Albert China, and it is not Japanese, even though it has an Imari or Orientalist flavor. Orientalist is an old-fashioned word, but it is a term that people use. It's Royal Albion China, and even Replacements Limited doesn't have much of this stuff. It's a hard pattern to find from the 20s. We take for granted today that you can just get any kind of fish from around the world when you go to a seafood place, but that was not true until the 1880s when refrigerated boxcars came along and you could suddenly get species that were not caught locally. As a result, fish sets became very popular. Fish knife sets and fish plate sets. This particular set was made in Europe, as most of them were. This was from the Limoges region of France. AK was one of many companies that did their work there. And they are generally transferware, sometimes with hand-painted embellishments. There's usually an oval platter and a set of six plates, and they can run for four to six hundred dollars. They are very collectible now. They do have some more modern items. This is from the 1980s, but I recognize it because it is in my book. This is Treasure Craft. This was one of the first cookie jars designed by Shi Yi Chen. She fled China with her family. They allowed her to take $100 and the clothes on their back. She'd been a ceramics designer, and Treasure Craft hired her, and she designed most of their cookie jars over the last 10 years of their production. Here's a better look at another wicker table with the wooden top. These were a very popular way to do wicker in the 1920s, and they're just a really great style, and they hold up better than the solid wicker. And then down here on the bottom, I wanted to show this jardinere. This is another Weller pattern from about 1915 or 20. I believe this is part of the Clinton Ivory line they did, and it's priced at $195, which is about proper retail for these these days. It may have had a pedestal originally. This is a good example of where brass is not always shiny and gold, and this might fool you into thinking that it's newer than it is, but this is Bradley and Hubbard. It's the Stag Hunt Scene desktop letter holder, as you see there. It's priced at 85 which is a fair price for a Bradley and Hubbard piece. And oftentimes they have the B&H mark on them. I'm not seeing it on here, but I have a hunch that this is an unmarked piece, but it could be verified from the books. This is Jeanette's Shell Pink, and this has become a very popular color in decorating again just over the past few years. So priced at 25 this relish tray is actually a pretty good deal, and yes, it was made in the 50s. It's a soft pink. It's a little pinker than what you can tell. Somehow the lighting in here is throwing the color. And then this is Arthur Armour. This is one of the more deco aluminum designers, and the deco style is what sells for the most. $60 is a fair price. This part of Georgia is really pretty much flat. However, I happened upon a little section that is a slide into the Chattahoochee River that was really different, and so I wanted to take a quick break and show you that. Not far from Parrot, about half an hour to the west, is this surprising park. It looks like the desert of the west with the hoodoos and the mass erosion. This actually was caused because when they kicked the Creek Indians out of here in 1825, the white settlers who moved in did not know how to farm the area properly. And this was all caused by erosion, but look how beautiful it is now. It's turned into a state park. This is also a good place while we look at this beauty spot for me to ask you to please hit that subscribe button because that way you can click the bell and be notified of future videos. Please like this video, leave a comment, and if you are interested in memberships you can click the join button below or hit the link in the description. We've added some member perks lately so you can find out all about that. Now we'll go back to this show after just a moment more of this lovely place. You know, I like to look for the thing that doesn't seem to belong, and this Art Deco styled late 80s Hager vase is absolutely on that list. And yes, I had to take it home. It's just really a great stark style with all that contrast. It's got the 1989 label right on the bottom, and for $22, yes, it's coming with me. Look how stylish that is. I have to admit, I like 80s Neo Deco if it's good. These are Staffordshire Spaniels, and interestingly enough, they're based on the English Water Spaniel, which went extinct around 1930. 
so you can only get them as ceramics these days. These were originally done in the 1850s in copper luster, and it was a very popular thing to have two of these on your mantle of your fireplace. They were redone in the 1890s, the 1920s, and again in the 1980s. The 1980s usually have an Arthur Wood mark on them. We're going to see if we can tell which era this is. Well, the dealer's done our work for us. So this is the 1920s, and we'll show you why. The style is the same on the exterior all the way back to the 1850s, but by the 1920s, the way that ceramic was finished was a little better. It has the copper luster that was popular both in the 1850s and the 1920s to 30s, but when we look at the bottom, we're going to see that there is a little better finish on the bottom, and you see a mold line and a very small vent hole. The originals were cruder, and they needed a larger vent hole to let the heat out when they were fired the ceramic because otherwise the piece would crack. Technology does improve over time. We can learn a little bit by this dog's base too with the funny texture here. I'm going to pick it up and you're going to see a couple lines underneath. So this is Royal Copley or Spalding or one of the Royal Windsor Sebring Ohio related companies that produced in the 40s 50s and isn't it cute with that texture on it. Not expensive like a Staffordshire dog though. And then right next to it, we have this really amazing Hubley doorstop. Hubley is a company that people my age might recognize from childhood because they made a lot of metal toys even up until the 1970s. But this is a 1920s or 30s cast iron doorstop. Now the elephant is hard to find. The original paint is very good. But this price is a long ago price. They do not sell for anywhere near this now. I love old line antique stores and brick and mortar but you do have to sometimes be careful of prices. If a place has been there for 30 years or more, it means that they were there back before eBay. And before eBay, we didn't really realize how rare or not as rare as we thought certain things were. And so you will sometimes see prices on things that have sat for a long time that are just way, way above what they can get now. And why they don't change them? Well, sometimes the dealers, they just, they're older, they're not on top of the market, they don't realize, or sometimes you see astronomical prices because a dealer really loves something and frankly, they should take it home and have it in their house. Uh, an antique store is not a museum. I am a big proponent in lower your prices until it sells and then buy something else because that's what keeps your spaces fresh and your stores interesting and makes people keep coming back. The Art Nouveau era had beautiful sinuous lines and was based on nature and natural forms and it largely missed the United States because we were in our very rectilinear arts and crafts phase around the same time. But poppies were an exception. Poppies were very popular because California was really growing then and the California poppy was considered quite beautiful. This particular piece was made in Germany, and it's priced at $90. These days that might be a little bit of an elevated price, but if it was Picard China from the same era with the same pattern made in Chicago, it would definitely be worth that. Here's a neat piece of Carnival chalkware. This should be about 1940s, and it says dated 1942. Well, these were not really dated. Let's see what they mean. Oh, look at that. Somebody wrote in pen where they won it. Rolling Green Park, July 1942, by Uncle Paul, Charles, somebody, and Grandpa. Aw, that's very cute, and it's got a little bit of glitter on it. It's got one chip under the ear, but the $26 price is still pretty reasonable for what it is. I'm really wary about buying things with chips. I know some people don't care, but to me, uh, it just makes a difference. And here is something that we see, and resellers will come into these because these were very popular in the 1960s. These are clad in leather, it's heat embossed, and they were made in Spain, and they almost always seem to feature Don Quixote, as this one does. But they're really neat, and I've seen better impressions and less great impressions of these. This one seems to be very well detailed, and it's got really good up close detailing that you can see and they are not usually marked but this one actually has the leather made in Spain mark so this one was pretty good quality in the time I typically sell these in the 30 to 35 dollar range because people like decanters 
And oh, it's even got the little hang tag that says Espana, so that's something different. And there he is with the Elizabethan collar. They are asking 45, not really bad for what it is. Now, barometers are not just a thing for guys, but I have noticed that around Father's Day and Christmas, these sell because people are looking for gifts for men, and so I always buy barometers if they're priced right. Now this is a nice earlier one made in the U.S. from about 1920, and it's a little more than I can afford to spend. Decorating magazines definitely have a lot of credence for people who like to follow decorating trends. They are a big influencer. This one says that these oyster plates are appraised at $150. Now, I have to say they are nice 19th century oyster plates. What magazine is this? Ah, Country Living. Okay. Country Living and Southern Living are definitely influencers around here. This is a great way to display if you're selling antiques as interior decor. But if you notice, their prices are not $150 on these oyster plates. They are usually selling for between about $65 and $100 these days. I think $150 is an insurance appraisal. But aren't they lovely? They are concurrent with the fish set that we saw earlier. Refrigeration allowed oysters to be shipped inland, and having oyster plates was a sign of your wealth and taste. This is an Art Nouveau desk set made of brass from about 1895 or so. And again, like the barometer, these are things a lot of people buy for men as gifts. You can see the Art Nouveau influences in the handle. It's definitely European. And look at the hole in the back there. That is actually a cigar cutter built in, because of course you were chomping a cigar at your desk back then. This very artfully decorated boy with his lamb, they're certainly having a good time marching down the street, is by Rosenthal. And this is before the Second World War. The People who owned Rosenthal had to flee during the war and then come back and rebuild after the war. The word under Germany there, Rosenthal is the logo on the top, and then under Germany you see Kunstabteilung, and that means art department, and next to it is Hangemolt, which means hand-painted. So when you see those marks, this means this is a good quality artware piece that cost a lot of money when it was new, and it is something to definitely look into. These sell nowadays anywhere from about $75 to $375, depending on the subject. Some of them were based on famous dancers in Germany at the time, for example, and those can go rather high. So very good quality and definitely something to look for when you're out there in the field. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of antiquing left in Parrot, Georgia, but the store that's there is good, and I was able to find some things, and that made me very happy because it was fun to go back there, and I really enjoyed being able to show all of you, and I wanted to come out not empty-handed, and I didn't. Some of these I bought because they were just inexpensive for what they were, and some of them I bought because they filled some categories that I'm starting to get low on. An example of that is this piece here. This is a little later than a lot of the Art Nouveau style Gouda pieces that you see, but this is Gouda, or Gouda, from Holland. It's got a nice mark. It's by the Zenith factory. There are lots of little factories in Gouda. So it wasn't just one pottery that made this stuff. It was under $10, so there's some room in that. I think they didn't really pay attention to what it was. The pitcher here, which I've had before, is antique bourbon, which I get a kick out of because they call it antique bourbon. It's made in Louisville. And yet this is age six years, which is not exactly antique, and it's by Contemporary Ceramics. It was very popular in the 1970s for liquor companies to have companies make this sort of ceramic advertising there where these pitchers and some were modernist looking. And in this case, well, it was antique bourbon, so they have an old steam train on there. That's probably worth about $24. And I have someone who looks for violets and pansies and purple flowers, and it's got a nice mark on the back from one of the Limoges companies around 1915 or 20. I showed a ribbon rack recently in the video from New Harmony, Indiana, and these are some of the ribbons. Now this says March 1917, but it says it came from grandmother's trunk. And when I look at the fabric, I think it's a lot older than 1917. I think that a Gibson girl wore these in 1917 in her hair because they came from her grandmother. She put them in the trunk then and wrote the note. So there's green ones and floral ones. This all looks like 19th century silk to me. 
especially because by the teens we're starting to get the weighted silk with the chemicals in it that cause it to dissolve. So I wouldn't expect these to still be around if they were from 1917. I think they're actually older. So that was a nice little buy because there was a bundle of them all together and I think they were all of about $15. Also in a bundle for $5 were these bejeweled fruits. They were sitting in a bowl and I think they were rather surprised that I would want them. And so they just made up a price. So, well, sure, if you want that, five bucks. And I said, yes, I do. And people like those now and I can see why. They're sparkly and fun. Well, pill box. It's 1960s, but it's Italian and it's micro mosaic like the jewelry we see so much work that went into taking all those little chips of glass and forming these designs and they'd have to use tweezers and glue to set them all in and you have to make sure all the pieces are there and they are so I thought that was fun you know they're worth maybe 20 or 25 dollars I think I paid about half that this piece is Dresden and I got it because I thought it might be a match for one that I had where I had a pair and one of them had damage, but I don't think that's the case. I think they're a little different pattern, but it's perfectly fine on its own. I paid under $20 for this, and it does have the Dresden mark, the Dresden Germany mark. So this is before the Second World War. The last piece is Austrian. This has a little dolphin on it, but this is a company called Bimini Werkstatt. And they were known for making very fine glass. It is so fine that when you pick this up, it feels like plastic. And I've found these in Goodwills and thrift stores before because people think that they're contemporary. But a lot of this was done, again, before the Second World War. They did a line of little cocktail stems with dancers in the stem. They always seem to have this type of a foot, very thin glass with a pressed rim. And that's a way that you can determine what they are and they feel very lightweight and like I said they almost feel like plastic. They can be fairly valuable. I would expect this would be about a 35 to 45 dollar piece even though it's just a four inch miniature. So Parrot may be largely a ghost town but those ghosts still provide some pretty cool stuff for us in the antique business and I'm glad that I was able to support the shop that's there. All those buildings have been renovated, and so who knows? It's a great location between Albany and Columbus, and with promotion, I think it could be an antique center again, so maybe that will happen. In the meantime, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Please catch me on the social media below. I look forward to seeing you in the chat, in the comments, and somewhere in the real world of antiques and collectibles. Bye for now, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!